so I collected some data. This is going to be all about my yes, no game. I collected some data over the last month or so, and uh, and then I crunched some numbers. I gave all of my any kid who was two that was willing to take, you know, take the test. It's a three minute game, my yes, no game. So um, you can go online and we'll put a link there for you to play the game. In fact, I'd like some adults to play the game. Not necessarily the musician friends that we have, but just some adults. And uh, what 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 I've discovered, I'm going to show you in my spreadsheet here, and I'm going to, we're recording this. We're recording this online uh, in a video. We're recording this in a video so people can, I'll post it. So you can look at the screen while we go. But uh, I got to turn this on. Uh, do not disturbo. All right, so share screen. So, and I taught you, so anyway, I. So, Bo, I administered my yes no game to any kid that would take it at, starting at two years old. And some of them just kind of stared at the wall. One girl would say, Can I go now? And like one girl just started breaking down into uh into a, a tantrum <laughs> because, which I is... even, because i was even asking her a question would you like to play the yes no game like no nah. just <laughs> yeah i mean uh terrible well, some two -year -olds. Thing. no it's not a terrible two it's just a normal two um just yeah exactly didn't want to be didn't want to do one of it she saw other kids go out and come back one at a time and i think she thought she was going to be tortured or whatever and then uh so but you know my three four year olds a couple five year olds are in there um and i basically had them answer my 10 questions is this yes tonic or no dominant uh and i don't have the capacity i don't want to go through the test now you can look at it online and I'll give you the link in the show notes for that. Yeah, <laughs> you changed it to Starts minor. With... I wonder what I wonder what would happen if we did change it to minor. See, there's there's a oh, good idea enough. already. Why why would it be any different in minor than major? So, all right. So let me go back to Zoom, share screen, and somewhere along the line, I messed up inputting the data for this spreadsheet that we're going to use today, but that, that doesn't matter so much. Um, I have a whole lot of kids who scored a five or higher, but I was eliminating some of them, but I didn't eliminate them all in this spreadsheet. So I don't know what the hell I did, but uh, so I've got 45 children here. Uh, three of them got a 10 out of 10. Four of them got a nine out of 10. Uh, six kids got an eight out of 10. And then I have a whole slew. So from 15 to 30. So that's uh, 14 kids. Uh, 14 kids got a seven. Uh, mm -hmm. It seems like even less got a six. This, this is what doesn't make sense to me. I should have more that have six and five. But I've got to go back and look at the data. But basically, uh, you know, I gave a one if they gave the right answer and a zero if they gave a wrong answer. And mm -hmm. what that what that starts out as is a sheet that goes, uh, you know, just what their answers were. Yes, no, yes, no, no, yes, yes, no, whatever their answers were. And then you got to take the columns where the correct answer is yes and change all the yeses to ones and all the ends all the no's to zero and then you take the columns where no is the right answer and you change all the no's to ones and all the yeses to zero and then you put those you know 
two sets of columns back together in the order. And you just basically get a, a spreadsheet of, oh, look at that, there's a mistake there too. Um, so basically you got item one to 10. I've got the names blacked out here, the school where they came from. I have to get them and put their ages because I don't have that information yet. I, I know offhand, but I don't know exactly uh, what their mm -hmm. ages are. And then here's their total. So like I said, I had three kids. One of these kids uh, that got a 10 is uh, three years old. Another one was four and another one was a three. He's, he's almost four. Uh, and then these other kids, there's a couple older kids in that next group of nines. Uh, and a couple older kids in that next group. There's a few kids that got a seven that are three, four, anyway. You see, I got a pretty, a decent distribution, but like I said, this, this document doesn't uh, have everybody in it. I, I started to subtract some of the students because I was looking around for uh, interesting information. And I didn't quite find it yet, but all right. So here's the first item and you take that entire column and you want to find out what the item difficulty is. So it's just mm. the average score wait one sec before we before we tee off into this i just want to be very clear for myself and the listeners um is this only quizzing people on you like you hear tonic and then you hear dominant or you hear dominant and you hear tonic or what what is the exact content involved in this test just before we get into difficulty so like are you adding four chords in here or or just no 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 it's dominant? my yes no game it's okay so it's just tonic my dominant. yes no game the way it's the way okay. it's laid out. I don't have my keyboard working right now, but if you go mm. tonic, to, oh, it, it is working. I wonder what happened. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Would you like to play a game? I'd like you to listen to Mary Had a Little Land. Can I end there? Fleece is white. I'm sorry, I was singing it. Fleece is white as. Can I end there? No. Do I end here? Yes. Fleece is white as? No. Yes. Would you remember that this is no? And this is yes. Remember if I played, oh, let's play the game. Remember if I play this, you're gonna say no. And if I play this, you're going to say yes. Let's play and have fun. And then it's no, yes, yes, no, yes, no, no, yes, no, yes. And those are 10 items. I think I did it right. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. That's exactly what I, I think will help everyone just have the right context in their mind here. Yeah. So I'll put a link for, for how to play that game in a survey monkey or yeah, it's also a fun. Okay. So now we're YouTube now, video. So now, now I've analyzed, you know, I've gotten the kids to answer these questions and it takes mm -hmm. three minutes to administer to each kid. A little over a minute for the directions and a little over a minute to answer the questions. Mm -hmm. And so now I've collected all the data and I've got items one to 10 across the top. I've got the kids' names along the side. I've got their total scores, you know, uh, accumulation on, on the, in a right hand column. But what I want to what I want to look at is the difficulty level of each mm -hmm. item. One other thing I want to be very clear about as we're going through difficulty, when you do, uh, like when you go from item one to item two to item three, are you using the exact same voicings on the piano for each uh, item? No. So like every no, time- Sometimes tonic is this. Sometimes tonic is this. 
So mm -hmm. the root is still in the in the bottom. Sure. But I didn't want to have them here high and low as tonic and dominant because even adults try to use a you know something. If they're all one thing and and the other, they they can figure it out without having figured it out musically. Mm -hmm. So I'm already seeing if I just look at the two items, I'm seeing an interesting uh, situation here where let me walk us through this, but. I, that second item, you know, is easy. Yeah. So, so is the yeah. second item the right, tonic me, chord? Yeah. Let me explain it. Over. Yeah, yeah. So, um, the first item, sixty-four percent of the kids got it right, and that was a mm -hmm. no. The correct answer was no. The second item, the correct answer is yes. And 96% of the kids got it right. So they call it difficulty level, but it's really an easiness um, level. So in this situation, only one person got that wrong. Uh, no, there's a couple. Oh, is there two? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Two. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes I see kids saying yes for everything that's no and no for everything that's yes. Like they get mixed up. And they just hear the change and they, they do that. So there's a lot of fluctuation. There's a lot of um, inconsistency. The We're going to look at reliability here in a minute, uh, mm -hmm. like how you measure that. But right now, let's just look at the difficulty level. And you want, a, you want a variety of difficulty levels. You'd like to see stuff, some items be more difficult, some items be more easy, and a lot in between. Okay, so 64% is the first item, 96% is the second item. On the third item, the correct answer is yes, again, but 41% get that one uh, incorrect. I think because they hear a change and they just guess exactly. that it's no, and it's a change from here to a change to here. So they're both yes, but you could... Um, I'm not 100% sure these are exact voicings, but my voicings have been consistent across. Um, I don't play the test. It's recorded. So I, I, oh, I'm okay. not... yeah, yeah, because that could be a confounder, right? And in, into yep. why people are making the mistakes they're making. Because if, yeah, that, that's why I brought that up earlier. Yeah. That's, no, so that, that's actually, so that's perfect. I didn't, I didn't realize you had recorded the test. So like I have, I have more faith in what you're doing now <laughs> since you said that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, you have to. You have to be consistent in exactly how. The only thing that I changed was sometimes mm -hmm. I would pause to give the kid another second or two to answer if they didn't. Okay. If, if they didn't yeah. answer, you know, or if the kid's eyes were well enough, I would say, Do you want to go back? <laughs> Do you want, you want to go back to your room? <laughs> You know, yeah, I mean, because at this age, you could part suffer. of the problem could be like an attentional thing, not even like an audiation oh. thing. They're just oh, not yeah. able to. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's all kinds of confounding factors in this. Yeah. So anyway, so you go on and item four, 76% easy. Five is 80%. Next one is 71% easy. Now, here's an interesting phenomenon, as you'll see. Here's the second no in a row. So here's no, and here's no again. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones that are most difficult. That's 38% easy. I wonder what you would get if you had a third one right after that, or if that's just yeah, starts to I get... Yeah, I would need a longer test. <laughs> yeah. A 20-item yeah. test, and that's just unbearable for a three-year-old. 20-item tests have like three repeats in a row, basically? Uh, I don't know how you would work it out. It, it's just, yeah. it's just, this is as long as you want to test, uh, at least totally, in my yeah, experience, totally. uh, for kids that are two and a half, three, and I'm using the same test for the older kids yet. Not necessarily. Does that mean that they're uh, better scoring, uh, mm -hmm. you know, high, you know, I call high eight, nine or 10, 
two at two years old is seven is a high score at three years old at eight is a high score at mm-hmm. four years old, a nine and a ten is a high score. <laughs> I mean, if you stop, if you stop, pause for a sec and think, a two-year-old getting seven out of ten of these right is phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, but I've got, but I've got a two and a half-year-old that got all ten. That's that's so cool. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah, it, they're hard I, to I find, about... and they have to really like it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this could have for me. You know, if I had. Um, some some evidence here that uh, my own like two year old was you know home running these tests. It, it very well might influence the way I even proceed with instruction in terms of how much time I spend on harmony versus rhythm and and uh, anyways you know I'm sure we'll get to that. Yeah yeah so um, so and these are all the population I'm testing here are kids that are all attending the daycares where I teach and I've been exposing them to yes, no, since birth. I'm not, I'm not teaching yes, no at birth, but I'm exposing it to them. I'm, you know, I'm cutting songs off the pentultimate chord, right? And let it linger. And I say, well, no. (laughs) Well, this is another interesting thing, because when you look at Eric's data here, um, I mean, the bell, like the middle of the bell curve is like seven you know maybe just like under seven like like 6.8 or something like that we could figure that out but it's like most of the kids are like the bell curve is like really healthy like in terms of how many they're getting right it's cool uh yeah it it's the outliers it's definitely discriminating um but you gotta know that i i took all the chance scorers out or i was trying to i i've still gotta this is good for this isn't the end point of my data crunching here because I've already seen a couple of mistakes and I always make um, you know a copy of the complete data set with yeses and nos and go back and recheck because mm-hmm. you got to be a hundred percent sure about this stuff you just don't want to mess up so um, all right and then once you get to the ninth and tenth item or seven, where were we? Eight, nine, 10. So 82% easy, 76% easy, and 82% easy. Those are, they call that a difficulty level, but it's an easiness. <laughs> the higher, the easier, the lower. So the one, one thing I want to, one thing I want to check on is like, cause I noticed the first item to the second item, it's the second item is substantially easier. So hearing hearing the dominant chord right up front and then the tonic chord right after it. How many instances in this test is, do you go from dominant to tonic? Because like, uh, I just want to see if there's a trend at, between. Here's here's dominant to tonic here. So that so dominant to tonic gets easier. And here's dominant in, to tonic, but that's the a different iteration of the tonic. Mm-hmm. So basically that... every time the students hear dominic and then tonic on the next one it's easier for them uh then the first time well i just mean like any any item it, like if we take if we take the difficulty of of any do, uh, dominant chord that is then followed by a tonic chord the preceding tonic chord is always seems easier for the for the group as a whole to identify than the preceding dominant chord you could look at it because we the that way i haven't i have this to me i want to talk to people right? about it because that that's one way to look at look at it is a progression rather than a, a number of items well eric i'm thinking because my own practice of doing this with students how many students do you have when they're first learning this you play the you play the dominant chord and then and then they're like that's the yes and then you play the tonic chord right after and they're like no 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 no, no. That, that's a yes. The other yeah. one was, yep. was, yeah. And, and that's what I'm coming from is just like the practical side of doing sure. this. A lot of times people need to hear both to, um, to be definitive on it. For sure. I think they might lose the context from the time the directions are given in that few seconds mm. uh, mm-hmm. that they, that they get confused. Anyways, that, that maybe we should establish it. tonality again in the middle of the of the game. I mean, that's that's interesting, right? I mean, if if uh, 
it'd be interesting to see if you kept everything the same, but you just established tonality after like every three questions or something, yeah. or every five, if yeah. it changed the the validity of uh, of not the validity yeah. of the test, but like the 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 precision that the students are able to uh, call the shots at. Yeah, you want to establish context if if it's being lost and and. Harmonic Improvisation Readiness Record, Gordon's H-I-R-R -R test. Yeah. He, you know, has uh, directions to just listen, and then he goes on with the, with the, you know, the items. So you can reestablish. Yeah, and I, th I think that's valid, too, because we, um, uh, supplying people with context is valid in the sense that we want to measure audiation skills that are being used in context anyway. So like when you're improvising on a tune and you need to, and we yeah. need to use our harmonic audiation, we're going to be improvising in a harmonic and tonal context. So we want to actually be testing people in a harmonic, in a tonal context. And I think supplying them with that to, to prime right. them with that is, is totally fine. For sure. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's, it's not, it's not cheating. Uh, to give kids better information so that they have a better chance of scoring if if what you're ultimately measuring is some level of their audiation, not some way that they've used to figure out how to answer the question without using their audiation. Because I gave mm -hmm. this to some of the daycare instructors <laughs> and they'd say, oh, that one's lower. So that's no. They would tell me out loud what they were thinking. So that's no, because that was a lower sound. And then they'd play another, and it would be, wait, I'm confused now. Because they would go back to higher, but they swear it was no still. So they weren't sure. And n none of the daycare workers got uh, 100%. These are adults from 20-something years old all the way up to 40, 50. I don't know how old some of the people are that, that took it just voluntarily. Because they're having fun. which I find which I find fascinating. You know this this type of inductive learning, this this inductive audiation. It it's not necessarily dependent on how old you are. I mean, uh, clearly you have two and a half year olds who are home running the test, and then you have adults uh, with probably reasonable amount of musical exposure over their life who are <laughs> not outperforming the two year olds. But, yeah, yeah, that's right. And so I, there's so there's this will give rise or give birth to a whole bunch of studies, I would hope, over time, uh, to, to give this to kids who are teenagers all the way down to the six-year-olds that I've been targeting. Uh, you know, because I wanted to get at early childhood stuff, but maybe this, this same game works to split off everybody in the general population, say. I don't know. Well, I, well, and Eric, I'm thinking like your results might be uh, skewed in the sense that you've been priming these students with these kind of harmonic discriminations, like at such a young age, like what would the results be of like a random daycare who had like some musical exposure, but not to the same, with the same focus that you had with the, where their, would their whole scores be skewed downwards slightly? Like, do you so, know, do, yeah. do you know that? <laughs> so, well, we did this, the first iteration I gave my test to another MLT teacher, but she was somebody who'd never taught yes, no. But you tested had, the teacher or, or their students? No, but her kids. She tested a whole school oh, okay. yeah, yeah. of her kids. Oh, and lovely. Her kids okay. uh, scored about the same as mine. Interesting. So it, it might not be a training thing. No, I might be wasting my time teaching it. <laughs> So, but, but hold on, you might be wasting your times in, in you might be wasting your times in, in time in terms of like increasing their harmonic audiation, but they're still learning content. Like in your class, they're still learning the, the content. I, yeah. Um, so it's, it's really interesting and I haven't come to a conclusion about it, but mm -hmm. I'm not, maybe I'm not wasting my time with only a few of the kids. <laughs> yeah, that's wild. That's and that's yeah, pretty so. upsetting too, right? In it, yeah, in another way, because it can. And, I think right. it can. It can and the other way <laughs> can kind of breed a sense of apathy, you know. If you and another way, what I'm doing is, uh, you know, really revealing that 
harmonic aptitude or whatever this is measuring is an animal all to itself, That's which what I'm I, thinking because it, yeah, go ahead. I just don't, I just don't know what it says if you can't teach it, but yet I'm teaching it to the few kids that get it. You know, what am I doing to the rest of them? Well, and this goes back to my experience with teaching. Um, I, I pretty much, I, I teach the same four functions that you teach up front, and then I just kind of go off roading from there. You know, I teach the one, five, Yeah. four, and the five of five. But in my experience, it's very similar to yours, is that if they're going to get it, I can get, I can teach it to them within five minutes or maybe at most a couple lessons. I can get all the, like three or four lessons at most, I can get all those four functions uh, reliably labeled and discriminated. But if they don't get it within those, within that time parameter, it seems like they almost perpetually struggle with it. And that's been something like your experience, right? Yeah, um, and that's what something like this can be used as a measure to help you understand. Um, but you also can't trust it necessarily. Uh, and, and we'll get I think what we'll. you were saying, what you were saying before, though, about this possibly being an animal in and of itself is because we know We know that proper instruction within a certain age window in, in general tonality and general uh, uh, rhythmic um, education will increase their, their aptitudes if it's done properly and within the right age window. But this may not respond with the same logic as the other aptitudes, which is or, you know, or uh, viewed from another angle, maybe we just don't know how to. teach these harmonic discriminations in the developmental window or maybe the developmental window is like much shorter than for the other aptitudes like maybe it's very aggressive like from zero to two if you don't hear enough of this stuff like it's because the other aptitudes cut start to close down around what you know nine ten Yeah. eleven It, kind it, of thing these are all possible scenarios which we need to do years of research and I would love to have the money to do that because um, it takes time and if time uh, right you can't spend it all <laughs> if you're teaching you can't spend And teasing this apart from tonal aptitude, like if, if we had, we had yes a listening repertoire that was really rich in harmony from zero to two, and we follow these kids to 11, and we could see like, is the harmonic aptitude stable when the tonal aptitude is going up through those years? Or is the harmonic aptitude stable like the whole time through those years? I mean, they're all really interesting questions, Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, it opens up a, a, a wide variety of, of problems. Uh, I would like to see a correlational study between uh, the kids who like things the wrong way and kids who only like music when it's played the right way. So major instead of minor or minor instead of major. When you ask them, you want to play it wrong, and the kid gets really excited, and they really love it the wrong way, it tickles their ear. I want to see a relationship between that and their tonal aptitude, or that and their harmonic Mm -hmm. well aptitude. so i mean i can give you some anecdotal evidence from from my own life um this is why i learned different tonalities i actually had a guitar teacher in high school who was like ah, don't bother with learning different tonalities like you just need major and minor and a lot of like the functions but i was obsessed like i would i would play all these little folk songs in different tonalities and i thought it was like the coolest thing or i would reharmonize things all the time and i liked kind of pushing that button a lot and i know i have you know reasonably high tonal aptitude so i mean and i i i think that's very possible Yeah. um it's very possible but there could be a bit of a personality thing there too you know just the person who likes to meddle with things too but Well, aptitude and intrinsic motivation, despite the teaching, will rule the day if you've got if you've got those two things. That's why I think there's exactly so much in the wild uh, as people are learning to teach themselves through inference and generalization. Uh, they need help. They need a coach. They need You know, generally they do, but some geniuses can do it on their own. Or... Well, that's what happened to me, right? I just noticed like some teachers would teach me audiation and some teachers would not. And then I eventually just on my own throughout high school specifically, I, I started figuring out that the people that could sing things and play things from memory, they could do something that the other people couldn't. And then Mm -hmm. I just kind of ran with that. And that was, Yeah. you know, Yeah. 
but that, that's an example of what you're talking about. I mean, that was that was kind of just fueled from having you know reasonably high aptitude and just pure blown interest in in learning it. And so I was weeding out things that worked yeah. and things that didn't work. Yeah, yeah. You were finding teachers that supported that what you thought uh, uh, for yourself be better to learn things by ear than to by, learn by rote. I mean, to learn, you know. Through and eventually d discovered the shorthand that it, teachers that couldn't improvise, I basically just didn't trust anything they said, which is hilarious. <laughs> like I arrived at that conclusion when I was like 13 and I, I still pretty much believe it today. I, you know, <laughs> I, I have a couple stories, but the one is when I found out my piano teacher in high school, uh, she liked Barry Manilow. I quit the next week. <laughs> <laughs> I just, oh. I just flat out and we were learning what were we learning we were learning uh variations on a theme by haydn um brahms yeah. right that's, that's a, some good that that's, nice. some good, that's some good literature <laughs> and some other stuff you know some other normal classical literature but i remember that one because i had to do two against three and i couldn't do it uh, uh but uh at any any rate um uh, so let me go on with the statistics. So we have the average yeah, yeah. difficulty of the items, 1 to 10, and it ranges from the lowest is 0.38, and it goes up to 0.96. All right, and those are, that's your difficulty levels. Then the average of the full score, that's your mean. All right, so it's just all the kids have got 10 plus all the kids got 9, blah, 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 and just divide by the number of kids. So the total score is all added up and divided by 45, and you get 7.04. So that's the oh, mean. Oh, wow. So it is 7. The mean is 7 of this group. Now, like I of said, group, i got to yeah, fix yeah. this. Um, now, this is the nerd in me. I love doing this. Is Now, you subtract the mean from each of these scores. So 10 minus 7.404 is 2.96. Okay? So you subtract the mean. So here you got a 7. And now you're down to you, the kids. Like, this is the, the you're subtracting the, the mean <laughs> from them. And you get these negative numbers. Well, how do you get rid of those negative numbers? You square them. So the square of the mean differences is what this column is. The square of the mean differences. Does, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You're subtracting the mean from your score, each individual score. And then you're squaring that. And then you add those up and divide by the number of kids or the average of the square of the mean differences. And that's your variance. That's how you calculate variance. And mm. variance is basically what a standard deviation is squared. Mm. So variance, the square root of variance is your standard distribution. And on a test like this, you'd want something closer to two. There's there's a way to calculate the um, the, the the what what you call a, a mean and standard deviation, a theoretical mean and standard deviation. Um, but this isn't theoretical. This is the real real one. So, so you get that. So you're saying if the standard deviation is closer to two, you can in, you can rely this, on the test validity more. The, you want it, yeah. You want a little more. The more variance, the better. But there's a there's a limit to that. Mm -hmm. um, and then the standard deviation. So that's how you just measure those. Okay. So here's one way to check the reliability of the test is to put it into a formula. There's a reliability uh, coefficient that you can. Uh, uh, calculate using a Cooter Richardson 20 is the name of the formula Cooter Richardson 20 uh, and the way you do that is you take the difficulty level for number one was 6.4 you remember and then take one minus that so it's just 100 minus that so 36 and you do that across the board so one minus the difficulty one minus the difficulty level for each item. And then you multiply, they call that P for some reason, and they call this Q. So P times Q 
equals this. And so do you get a, and this will only make sense if you're watching the video, folks. I think it's too much to try to explain. Is you take the difficulty level and the next number you calculate is one minus the difficulty level. And that gives you Q. They call the difficulty level P. One minus P is Q. And then you multiply P times Q and you get mm. this. Mm -hmm. You get those 10 items and then you add them up the sum of PQ. Okay. All right. So with, with the Cuda Richardson formula to calculate um, the reliability of this kind of um, measure is you take the formula is how many items do you have in the test? 10. What's, and then divide that by the number of items in the test minus one. And I don't know how statistics figures these things out. So yeah, always. <laughs> so the number of items in the test is 10 divided mm -hmm. by 10 minus one. So it's just 10 divided by nine. Mm -hmm. you multiply that by one minus the sum of PQ divided by the variance. And the sum mm. of PQ divided by the variance is calculated first. And then you one minus that, and you multiply that times 10 over nine. Right. And that'll give you, okay. and that'll give you a reliability coefficient. Now, something is seriously wrong <laughs> and i've checked it and i have to try to check it again there's no way it can be zero but it's zero yeah i noticed that <laughs> so, so and, and just to put that number go. in context what, what are we what are eight, we looking ten for dec decimal points off it's zero 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 one six two three basically there's no reliability at all <laughs> zero like you can't possibly get lower it's 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 insane but does that mean i shouldn't trust these two and a half year olds who have gotten 10 or the four year olds that got eight or the whoever right what what is this what what it shows me is there's just a lot of guessing mm -hmm. and again i have to go back and, and do with the full data set because this was it it got cut off or i saved it in the middle of something and i just have to reopen the, the one with all the because you never mess with the original data you put in the original data double check it and then you copy that before you do anything with it because god forbid you screw that up you'd have to go back through and and do all the scoring again or whatever but um but at any rate i don't trust what i have here but it's a way to understand how to calculate a reliability coefficient for a for a test that has you know right and wrong items one question i had for you because i um <laughs> i know it's like this with gordon's other aptitude tests or just gordon's aptitude tests where you know they'll play something and it'll say was that a change in tonal or a change in in rhythm or don't answer and so like because this test could i feel like could be open to like you said guessing but do you leave the possibility for the student just not to answer as part of the, yeah, or will they kind if, of if they don't, say something? I count it as wrong. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's the same way he does with Audi H. I mean, Audi H. That's what I want to call this one, with Audi M mm -hmm. and Audi R. Audi M and Audi R is the same exact kind of test. Hello. In fact, there's no. There's no chord. Hello. Would you like to play a game? My name is Audie M. I have a special song. Whenever you hear my special song, would you say yes? Whenever you hear, whenever you hear not my special song, would you say no? Remember my special song. Uh, uh, 
Ready? Mm -hmm. Let's play and have fun. Right? And then. <laughs> I don't know what he does for the 10 items. He so this, he this won't change the rhythm. Us. He won't change the rhythm on the flip side of that. Yeah, totally. Cassette, yeah, yeah, totally. On the but flip side the... of that, it, this is my special song. It's the same exact special song. Whenever you hear not my special song, it'll always be so me do, but it'll change the rhythm. Or yeah. it'll be exactly the same rhythm as the special song. So this is one thing I wanted to bring forth with the um, the difference between uh, uh, what is it, Audi T and Audi R? Is that what it is? Audi, Audi M from Melody. Oh, Audi M. Melody okay. and so, Melody. Because the the potential problem I see with the with the um, the way that you're you're testing yes and no is that you're actually you're actually asking them to to memorize two separate things at once and quizzing them on two things at once. So I'm seeing like a potential uh, variation in this test is just asking students, is this the yes chord or is this not the yes chord? But instead of instead of making all the not yes chords, five chords, making them other things too. So like you have like, remember my yes chord, bomb. And then you 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 could have more kind of uh, potential very. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So sometimes it's a five, sometimes it's a four, sometimes it's like tritone sub. And like, I feel like you could you could weed out more specifically yeah. which things are confusing people yeah. Um, because, yeah, I could see some potential problems where like every, you're asking them to memorize two things at once, yeah. essentially, make two, yeah. di two, two discriminations at once. Yeah. And yet, but you know, I'm just, just at some level. Ideas. Like, I, I, yeah. So yeah. when I did this before in 2019, so four years ago, I guess is when I first unveiled this. It seems like it would have been a little bit longer ago. Um, I did get a reliability of 0.57 or so. Uh, uh -huh. And I double checked everything. And I also had you know, a slew of kids that I didn't teach. Uh, mm -hmm. Not that that necessarily mattered. I just had more children when you have more children you have a chance to have more for, for variance yeah and uh it, the um the result the reliability is very similar in fact it's almost identical to the audi m and audi r test that gordon had and i had okay because uh, that's and i had yeah cindy say to me cindy taggart who came up to me after I presented my research, uh, say it's it's possibly a case where you can still have some validity in understanding a child's, you know, where they're coming from, what, what their aptitude is, but not have a high enough reliability to, to count on the results. Uh, Mm -hmm. Which is interesting to me because I didn't know Gordon thought of Audi M and Audi R as not having uh, a, reli a, a reliability that met his uh, expectation. And for that age kid, a 0 0.7, 0 0.75 would be low or in that range of acceptable. And a 0 0.5, yeah. 6 or 0 0.6, no, it's just not acceptable for this kind of game. But who knows? Because I don't know what reliabilities are to be expected for kids that young. I just say that, look at my kids at two, they can answer this, but they can't necessarily answer the questions in Audi M and Audi R. So his test doesn't work with two-year-olds. Mine works a little bit younger. Which, I mean, that in and of itself kind of shows uh, a potential discrimination or distinction between how people are audiating harmony versus melody like to begin with because if you can't even answer the damn question you can't even answer a damn melody question at two but you can you can answer a harmonic question at two let alone like measuring what yeah. their harmonic aptitude is like they're not even able to participate 
in that activity yeah. for the other well, aptitudes. I don't, and I don't have, I wish I had the raw data of his studies with Audi M and R because mm -hmm. he might have just thrown out all two-year-olds altogether rather than including the ones who are uh, that, operating yeah. in a valid way and in response to their audiation, not just guessing because you can't get, you know, 90 or 100% <laughs> without knowing what's going on. So maybe there are a handful of kids that he had also that could score yeah. super high uh, and would be valid, but he threw out all two-year-olds because they're way more unreliable. <laughs> Gordon's, uh, Gordon's research led him to possibly conclude that the, the subjective reports of two-year-olds are just unreliable. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, fair enough, because you can't, uh, even if there is some potential um, true discrimination happening at that age range, if they can't answer the questions, it's so hard to make extrapolations, like based on groups. Yeah. Here's the It'd be cool if there was some objective way of telling if a two-year-old, like not, not taking their subjective report, like if there's some objective way, like we could just like have a two-year-old in a, some kind of EEG, um, set up where we can just tell if their brain can make the discrimination, not taking their verbal record as um, what we're using to score the test. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. so there's a lot of be... things that go into, so there's a subjective validity, which is just your opinion. Do you yep. agree that I should be testing tonic and dominant? Or like you said, could I swap out dominant for other functions or other sounds, you know, have tonic mm. and then squirrel. <laughs> tonic <laughs> and a wicked witch tonic and then dominant tonic and then tritone substance <laughs> you know or even uh, like is tonic, this tonic like or tonic something or... else just right yeah yeah like tonic but you change like you turn it into like a sus two chord like you change me to ray or something like that and so it's like yeah. like there's a lot so, of things being retained so, so there's the... just like something off right so you could do that. You could look at it uh, in terms of its reliability uh, just within a group. So within the two-year-olds, within the three-year-olds, within the four, not combining them all, that would be a lot better data than having just uh, 30, you know, what did I say, 45 kids here. Um, the other subjective validity, do you think the way the test is, is um, is uh, presented to the children is that fair or should there yeah, be like should, should you have a yes block and a no block and have the kid grab at the block that has that so that they can make a decision um yes no not just with their words because some kids are language uh delayed mm -hmm. at two <laughs> what's language delay at two i don't know or, or but, should we yeah. be reestablishing contacts after every question exactly like Those that. are, that's another content uh that's that's another thing that you could include subjectively add that or having done this a bunch of times and doing it with the other way a bunch of times now it's less subjective it's objective because the kids uh do better with that but what about the kids who don't need it so should there be more items in the test, right? Should there be less items in the test? These are all kinds of things. But then you've got to look at objective validity, right? Which is mm -hmm. what we're trying to uh, get at here through uh, reliability. Uh, does this actually, objective validity would be, does this actually uh, predict children's harmonic achievement later in life? That would be an objective validity measure. It's like down the road, the long, they call that a longitudinal predictive validity study. Down the road, do these scores match, correlate with their performance scores on some harmonic performance measure, not an aptitude measure? Another validity would be, do these scores match uh, up, correlate well with Dr. Gordon's harmonic improvisation readiness record? That's a construct validity or piggyback validity. Mm -hmm. What do they call it? Uh, 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 anyway, uh, 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 con, con, it's another con 
<laughs> I'm forgetting. It's been a while since I've had the books open. Uh, it's another validity where you're piggybacking the validity of something that's already been proven. Mm -hmm. so my test could be shown to have validity by piggying back on a test that already has been proven to be valid. And that's basically what he did with so much of his research, uh, IMMA especially. He didn't do much research on it. It's yeah, I mean, because even looking at your, your sheet here, I mean, my one of the th questions that comes to my mind is like if we take the kids that got 10s and 9s on this, um, I would like to see longitudinal information of like which one of these kids develop an interest in like harmonically, you know, sophisticated music, like playing jazz or playing certain kinds of classical music that have just like ridiculous chord substitutions or, or harmonic progressions. And I, I, I mean, I, I don't see a reason to think like, I think any one of these kids possibly could develop an interest in those kinds of music, but I, it'd be interesting to, to see, like, do the kids on your test that get 10 on this tend to actually compose more harmonically interesting music, not theoretically, but just like kind of like a freight train through their audiation. And, and, you know, what's the difference between the kids that get the sevens and the sixes? Um, yeah. Yeah. I, there's, there's, there's a lot it, that goes into it. Um, another piece of information is item discrimination values, which I didn't put up here. Item discrimination, mm -hmm. do the kids who score higher on the test, so the top half of the class from here to here, say, right, exactly half, and subtract that from the kids who score lower on the test. There are mm -hmm. times uh, where you want that discrimination value to be fairly low, and there's times you want to a curve, mm. a standard curve of those kinds of things, uh, of those kinds of uh, discrimination values too. I just hadn't calculated them yet. I only spent a little bit of time. I've done this a million times, um, and I, what I, what I need to do, is uh, go find my original data set and start over because I don't want anybody to use this uh, as a. It's a practical uh, uh, example. Basically, uh, it's not the result of my study at all because it's, I don't, it's, when I see a mistake, it's like I throw the whole thing out and start over. Yeah, but I, I still think it's an interesting exercise to walk through. Um, yeah. You know, especially when we're in the, the realm of making hypotheses for, for, for how all this stuff works. I think it's yeah, interesting if to you start taking stabs it. at this. So I think, so one thing and i'll t i'll tell our listeners and you this this was the first iteration of the test i never changed it once mm -hmm. i recorded it i never changed it and it seemed to have worked and i think the reason it did is because i knew audi uh, i knew audi r and audi m i knew uh pmma and imma and music aptitude profile I knew my students, I knew, uh, you know, so much of measurement theory and, you know, how to evaluate children uh, based on measurement, you know, ideographic, which is how is the student doing based on his own aptitude or how is the student mm -hmm. doing among his peers? It's two different questions with super mm -hmm. high aptitude doing great among his peers if he's performing well in class but according to his aptitude he should be going you know leaps and bounds further so mm -hmm. that's an ideographic versus a normative evaluation of of kids uh and if you know that kind of information you know you you, you give kid a grade like you're doing phenomenal next to the kids in your class but you're not up to snuff based on what you should be doing and that mm -hmm. kind of information is lost in a b c d grades uh what what is it oh mean? Yeah, yeah we have no idea what grades mean and if if everybody just passed out means and standard deviations they just don't like negative numbers that's what made people turn in means and standard deviations are basically what the sat scores are like if yep. you get a 500 on a test we scored at the mean 
and the 600 mm -hmm. is one standard deviation above and 400 is one standard deviation below right? that's what i find so interesting about how the chess ratings are calculated because they're 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 compared like your chess iq your chess rating is compared to the entire competitive chess community it's not it's not just based off of you know your your kind of arbitrary Little. ability to, to yeah. yeah it's 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 related to other people and and their age ranges and and uh, you know this all that it's it's super cool actually yeah yeah so math is our friend i'm a little bit of a m number nerd i like i i don't know how these formulas get invented <laughs> it's nuts to me but you could see mm -hmm. uh when i click here the formula uh, down here in the lower corner where it says formula okay. 10 divided by 9 times 1 minus the total of pq which is this one that 1.78 yep. and p47 is uh is the orange number highlighted so and see they on the, what numbers am i using the two that just highlighted those are the ones in the formula and they show up here in the formula this way so, um, no, I find this, I find this fascinating. And I, um, I mean, one of the, my biggest values just in terms of education is bringing some kind of empiricism to it, where you're making decisions and, um, testing hypothesis out, uh, hypotheses out in a way that, um, it's actually looking at some kind of data. And then, so when you, when you start meddling with doing things a different way, you're, you're doing it under the scope of you know, some kind of rational. <laughs> yeah. Agenda. Yeah. I, I want more, I want to get a wider variety of discrimination values and a wider variety of difficulty levels. And they're somewhat interconnected, right? Oops. And, uh, and then you use that information to, you know, increase the validity of your measurement, uh, by, you know, making sure it's reliable and this is not reliable <laughs> and neither is RDM and RDR. The last, yeah, the last, I think I said the last administration of this, I, I had a, a, yeah, I did, I said already similar reliability to what Dr. Gordon found in his uh, administrations of his Audi games. So yeah, um, it's good stuff. I, mm -hmm. I enjoy it. I mean, let me, um, let me circle back to this when I have it done correctly. Cool. Yeah, no, I, I can, I I can just do the bottom line here. of it, but you'll need to have this podcast in your brain beforehand. Definitely. Yeah. I, I find it interesting. And I think there's a lot of people out there, uh, like myself who, you know, are borderline obsessed with music education, pedagogy and research. And I would eventually like to do, something like this myself with, you know, other topics that I'm interested in and, and watching Eric, you know, walk through his thinking process on this is, uh, invaluable for me. And I'm sure other people, other people find it very interesting too. Um, well, hope so. it's hard to kind of have these conversations with people unless you're like in a friggin' <laughs> PhD program, like mentoring with somebody, right? I mean, that's usually the avenue this is done. It's usually not people's Sunday afternoons, just like, <laughs> Uh, diving I, into this. I but... learned this with Doc himself, and then I had to go through the class again as a PhD student, and mm -hmm. it was a piece of cake uh, almost both times, really. That's what I'm saying. Like, I, I think this is this is great, like priming information for people who are going to get into uh, music education research. Like, I think I think we need more of this, you know, in the MLT community. There's oh, there's definitely sure. some stuff going on, but I think the uh, you know, I think Gordon was kind of the progenitor of this kind of rational audiation research. And I think uh, he would want to see the baton being passed into the future and continuing it rather than just kind of hammering on what he did. Because he even said, like, there's just so, there was so much stuff he could research and there's so little time in one person's life, even though he lived, yeah. you know, to a pretty good age. It's just not possible for one person to carry out that much research. Now let's intertwine this with Engelman. And if you score, you know, on a several measures and then it maps out your harmonic learning quest for your life. 
and mm-hmm. projects you to be Charlie Parker at 22. And mm-hmm. then later, well, and, and this is and this is a really interesting. By 40. <laughs> <laughs> this is an interesting thing that comes out of this because when we try to create like a static curriculum and, and that we put a bunch of students through, just like Eric was saying, it's like, well, one person's tonal aptitude or harmonic aptitude is just should be um, taken into account when you when you look at the curriculum that they're being put through. And, and so Engelman was a huge fan of putting people in groups based off their ability. But unfortunately, we can't always do this in music instruction you can't say like my tuesday is my high tonal aptitude kids with medium rhythm aptitude and my wednesday is high tonal aptitude kids with high rhythm aptitude and i have separate curriculum for them like it's we we, we're not at that point where we can do that so the curriculums kind of have to to change and eric's mentioned this for for a long time on the podcast where he said that like uh, and i agree with him that often i don't think we push the high aptitude kids enough oh for sure we kind of hold that content we kind of we kind of think they have to master all this like lower level content before we throw crazy stuff at them. And I think that's one of the reasons a lot of people never learn like jazz substitutions is like no one just like straight up throws tritone subs at them. They like think it's something they have to wait for until they're in like university or something. <laughs> you know, for your right, my four year olds recognize it. That's all I can say. Yeah, totally. Well, that was that was a lot of fun. <laughs> all right. Till next time. You should take Eric's uh, 